Welcome to India. We are here in the busy, bustling heart of Mumbai, standing in front of this extraordinary edifice here, the Victorian Gothic Chaturapati Shivaji Terminus, known by the locals as CST. This is a transport hub on a huge scale. Trains coming in and out of this station carry the same amount of people every day as use the entire UK rail network in just one city. It runs passenger trains 365 days of the year, 21 hours a day, and we'll be going behind that beautiful facade as we've got access to every area of the station. And over the next four programmes, we'll be showing you just what it takes to keep a place like this running. Here's what's coming up. Over the next four nights, we'll plunge you into the heart of this organised chaos. Tonight, it's all about rush hour. These are the busiest trains on the planet. We'll see if we've got what it takes to join Mumbai's five and a half million rail commuters. I'm literally not on my feet. I'm lying back on these people. Across the series, Anita is focused on the railway's supersized logistical challenges. Tonight, she reveals a home-cooked lunch delivery service that defies belief. Do you yes. get a dupper delivered at work? Yes, I get every day from my wife. Robert explores the feats of extreme engineering that underpin this station. Tonight, he discovers how they stop one and a half thousand daily trains colliding. This board looks so confusing. There's so many lines, so many numbers on it. I'll be delving into the station's history and experiencing life as a railway worker. OK, the train's coming. <laughs> We've been told to go quicker. And we're joined by John Sargent, who rides the historic railway that brought tea to the English. Welcome to the world's busiest railway. Just before we immerse you in the mayhem of Mumbai's rush hour, let's get our bearings. Mumbai is on the west coast of India, built on a peninsula of land surrounded by the Indian Ocean. The Chhatrapati Shivaji terminus is right at the southern tip of the city. The station was opened in 1887. It was built by the British. India, of course, back then was part of the British Empire. The reason it was built here, quite simply, was because Mumbai was and still is a major port. If you were coming to India from Britain, you'd arrive, chances are, right here. And that's why the first passenger carrying lines in India are these ones just over here. People would continue their journey into the Indian interior by train. And it's being at the centre of that rail network, being so connected to the rest of India and the world, that turned Mumbai into an economic powerhouse, which it remains to this day. It's a remarkable city. This is India's city of dreams. It's financial capital, home to billionaires, and a magnet for ambitious Indians hoping to make their fortunes. Everyone here is trying to get ahead, which means it's busy, hot, and extremely competitive. A century ago, there were a million people living here. Now, there's over 17 million. That's much, much bigger than the population of London, crammed into a space a third of the size. All that means that personal space here is really a premium. Property prices rival those of Manhattan. But the 55% of the population who can't afford this city's sky-high prices call these illegal slums home. There are extremes of wealth and poverty here. There's also a huge number of people in the middle. Office workers, teachers, professionals, all of them rely on this mega city to support themselves and their families. And there's just one way for most of these middle classes to get to and from work. The crowded suburban trains. More than two and a half billion journeys are made on them every year. 
They are the essential lifelines of Mumbai. Without them, this pulsating city and all the wealth it creates would grind to a halt. And right at the very heart of this railway network is our station, CST. This is the suburban concourse. This is the beating heart, the terminus of the world's busiest commuter rail network. There are seven platforms here, and at present, lots of them have got trains on. Tens of thousands of people are pouring through this station all the time. It is 10 to 10 in the morning. It's already absolutely sweltering in this station, but these people don't mind. They've got places to be. They are flowing out here through the exit there into the downtown business district of Mumbai. These are the foot soldiers of Mumbai's economic miracle. They've got places to be, like commuters all around the world, and uh, they don't let anything stop them. We've got a train coming in here, actually. Let's have a look at this. You'll see overhead electric cables, so they're not steam powered, as lots of people still think Indian trains are. But like, notice here, people are hanging out of the doors. Uh, there aren't any doors on these trains. Well, actually, there are doors, but they've never, <laughs> they never ever get closed. And look at this, as the train starts to slow down, what's going to happen is people are going to jump off. Look at those guys, they're jumping off a moving train. Uh, and so that allows people to get on and off these trains very efficiently, very quickly. Quite dangerously, really. But this is a woman, a ladies' carriage. So here on this network, men and women travel separately. So here are all the ladies coming. And beyond them, a great tidal wave, a torrent of men heading down this platform like a surging river in flood. Uh, it's quite intimidating, really. And the doors, no doors is one way. They manage to get so many people in and out of this station. You don't have to wait for the doors to beep and open like you do in the UK. But what also allows people to get in and out of this station is the fact there are no ticket barriers on the end of this platform, no bottlenecks. So people just come piling out of these trains, charging down the platform and straight out through that exit, ready to get on with their day's work. Now, as you can see, it's quite intimidating being in the heart of Russia. I'm thinking going the wrong way. I'm getting jostled here, pushed out of the way. Uh, but Robert, Anita and I wanted to experience exactly what it was like to ride these trains, to experience the super dense crush load. And we did so for ourselves at the height of a Mumbai rush hour. It's just before 9 a.m. And across Mumbai's 116 stations, five and a half million commuters are catching the train to work. What have we let ourselves in for? Right, here we go. I'm going in. Come on, Anisi. You can get the tube, you can get a Mumbai railway. We're right to be anxious. These are the most densely packed trains in the world. Inside, as many as 14 people can be crammed into a single square meter, the same size as a phone box. Conditions are so bad, they have a special phrase to describe it. This is super dense crush load. To see just how tough it is for Mumbai's commuters, we're traveling on different lines. Dan and I are on the harbor line. And I'm on the central line. Quite nervous about this. We're all used to commuting in the UK, but this is going to be more like a contact sport. Just reaching the platforms is a challenge. I'm swimming against the street. Got no choice where I'm going, just being swept along. This isn't going to be like any commuting experience we've ever had. It's not just the crush on the trains that's coming as a shock. Commuters think nothing of crossing the tracks to move between platforms. Although it's illegal, it's so widespread that the authorities can't do much about it. Nine people are killed on Mumbai's suburban network every day. Most are run over on the tracks, but commuters also regularly fall from the trains and these risks are constantly in your face. I'm worried for your safety. I'm worried for your safety. Whoa, now that is aggressive. Oh my God, the train's moving. Right, I'm gonna get my train. How hard can this be? Here we go, this is the scramble now. Has it stopped? Yeah, they're getting off already. 
Commuters only have 15 to 35 seconds while the train stops to get on or off. Oh. It's terrifying to watch. Oh. <laughs> and genuinely physically intimidating, even for someone my size. Frightening and violent, and yet everyone's grinning. They're all grinning away. And people, I mean, that was a, just a, that was just a huge bun fight to get on and off that train, isn't it? Everybody seems fine now. At this time of day, each of these trains is carrying close to 5,000 people. It won't get quieter until after 11 o'clock. So it's now or never. I think we're going to do this one. Come on. <laughs> There we go. I'm literally not on my feet. I'm lying back on these people. I don't think I've been pressed up against this many men since uh, ladies' night at the Hammersmith Palais back in the 90s. Should be playing Come On Eileen. Dan may have muscled his way on, but in the ladies' carriage, I'm hoping it's more about strategy. What, what advice would you give me to get on a train? You have to push it finally. Push? <laughs> yeah. Final yeah, push. push. Yeah. It's a push. Drastic push. Without like that, you are not going to get it in the train. OK, yeah. a drastic push, otherwise I will die. OK, no, no, that sounds that, terrifying. That right, I'm getting on the next train. I'm getting on the next train. Here we go. <laughs> OK, I've missed it. You have to be in a queue. OK, I'm in a queue. I'm in a queue. I'm in a queue. Male, female, old, young, there's just one rule. Push or be pushed. Time for me and Anita to man up and do this. I'm going to get on this one. This is the one. The next one, I'm getting on. <laughs> if it's not difficult enough already, we've got to get our camera operators on board to record the experience too. Stick with me. Oh. All right, I'm getting on. Let's go. <laughs> We're getting on. We're getting on. Quick, chalo, chalo. Oh! I'm on. We made it. I made the train. <laughs> I think the one thing I'm not worried about is falling over. I'm not going to fall over. The temperature's pushing 40 degrees, and we're travelling at 35 kilometres an hour. It's a full-on assault on the senses. Fresh air is a precious commodity. We're beginning to understand the rules now. Part of the reason there's such a massive scrum is because people are trying to get on, but they're trying to stand near the door. And I can see why. All the lights suddenly went off, but the fan is still working, and that's the important thing. I don't need light, but... The air is a blessing, believe me. That fan blowing down is fantastic. Apparently, it's not as crowded as it normally is. That's why I had it easy. That didn't seem easy. That wasn't easy. Hard to believe, but since, since I got on, it's actually thinned out a bit. I'm not completely crushed. I, I have to hold on or I'll fall over, so I've got a bit of room there. Not much. <laughs> This could be pretty grueling, having to do it day in, day out. Your daily commute. This is your start to work. If I had to do this every single day, it would drive me mad. Well, that was the super dense crush load at rush hour, yeah. and it does exactly what it says on the tin. Sorry. I feel dense, even more dense than usual, and totally crushed. <laughs> I'm actually, I reckon, a couple of millimetres taller because I've been squeezed like a tube of toothpaste. It's funny, <laughs> isn't it, how 
there is an unspoken sort of culture and rules to it all. Everyone gets on and, yeah. and shuffles around. It's, it's an interesting system. I mean, it's, it, it's quite terrifying that the initial entrance, the transition from platform to carriage, is quite tense and noisy and boisterous, I well, think it would be Well, I saw a few punches thrown and yeah, stuff. I mean, there's obviously an invisible line where people cross that. Yeah. Voice are raised, punched the throne. I mean, it's quite. It's but a once, you're, once you're in and crushed, yeah. then I was I was really happy. It was very funny. There was everyone was smiling and laughing. It well, was nothing very can happen to no, you. No, you can't go anywhere. You're not going to fall over. That's for sure. Absolutely extraordinary. But the thing I noticed when I got here, I hadn't looked in the mad panic. Was that is my ticket? So five rupees. That's what it cost me five to do five that pence, journey. Five pence. Five pence. And that was a journey of about oh, well, over 15 minutes. So, yeah, it's definitely cheap. It's definitely cheap. You get your money's worth. <laughs> Not got a lot of room, but you get your money's worth. Well. Well, and of course, the way I guess they can make it so cheap is those doors are open. See those yeah. doors open? It's extraordinary. Yeah. People just hanging on the outside. So many people heading into the middle of Mumbai. Absolutely extraordinary. And, and I've seen that from outside the trains before, where the people hang outside. You just kind of get used to it. But when you're actually on the train and you see the posts that are flying yeah, past, the danger, past. and they're hanging right outside it, that, it's, it's difficult to put it in context because there's so many people travelling on so many trains. It is just, it is incredibly dense and complicated and that's absolutely extraordinary I mean and up, uh, even when they stop at a suburban station yeah. how short is that as little as 15 seconds sometimes <laughs> they, they hardly pause but yeah. that's how you keep the speed yeah. up that's how you get yeah. the, the density on the rail isn't yeah. it because... and then when they get into here the, the turnaround time in here so trains are coming in so while we've been here zooming in all the time zooming out all the time and that that turnaround is kept to the minimum time possible and that's I've discovered is called the headway in peak hours, they aim to get a train in and out of each platform in three minutes and 30 seconds. Keeping this headway period to time is the secret to keeping everything running on schedule. With rush hour easing off, Anita's got the chance to show us around a train and how the headway operation works. I'm on platform four. This is the slow train that's coming into CST, the end terminus where it will come to a standstill, then it will have an optimum time of three minutes and 30 seconds to get itself ready to go back out. It's five to 11. You can still see it's very busy, but rush hour is over because most people have already got into their offices, but it's hot. Hello, madam. It's sweaty. There are thousands of people in there. Another unusual aspect of these trains are these double discharge platforms introduced in 1990. Let's walk through this lady's carriage and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about, you can get on and off from both sides. And that is to deal with the sheer volume. Everything here is just on a massive scale. Take the train, for example, 12 carriages long. It can take, well, it's supposed to take, 3,500 people. It can carry up to 5,000 people, all crammed in, give or take a few, to give you just something to think about. A, a, a capacity train running from Leeds to Manchester at rush hour can take under 1,000. So you see the volume, the numbers are enormous here. Now, it has a first and a second class. I've told, been told that the difference is very little. The first class seats have, are padded, the second class aren't. But I've also been assured that first class is no more comfortable than second class. But the price difference is huge. Most people are commuters, so they buy a monthly pass. In first class, that will set you back £7.45, 745 rupees. In second class, it's only £2.15. Now, how on earth are any of these tickets checked? Because Dan pointed out there are no barriers. Well, I've been told there are ticket checkers roaming, 10 of them, the station today. They do randomly pop up, sometimes on a bridge, sometimes on the platform, and a brave conductor will even get on the train sometimes. And if you're caught without a ticket, the fine is relatively very steep. It's 200, minimum 250 rupees, that's £2.50. But when you consider that an average daily wage of a Mumbaiker is 340 rupees, you can see that you would not want to be stung with that. Now, how do any of these commuters know where they're going? There is a board at the back that will tell us this train was due to depart at 10.56, so it's already one minute and 39 seconds over. It's going to Kurla, that's what the C stands for. It's a slow train and it is a whopping 12 carriages long. Now, we know that it has separate ladies' compartments because there's a picture of a beautiful lady in a sari there painted on the side, but also there are signs at the top, at the middle, and at the back of the platform. Now, when I rode in the ladies' carriage in the super dense crush load, I asked a very smiley, friendly woman, would she give up her seat for me if I were pregnant? She smiled at me and said, 
No, madam, you could go in the disabled carriage. So there is a separate disabled carriage. It says for the disabled and for people with cancer, it's for anybody who's generally very sick. Now, what is happening at the front of the train? Well, whatever happens at the front goes on at the back. So a driver has jumped off as this train got in, a guard has jumped on, and at the front, a guard has jumped off, and a driver has jumped off. The sign at the front did say CST Terminus. It's now saying, good luck. What we are waiting for is this light to switch on. It will tell us that this train is ready to depart. The bell is ringing. Somebody is waving, so she's expectant, hoping that it's going to depart, and off it goes. That train took four minutes and 44 seconds. A bit over time, but not bad. Now, as passengers, we kind of take it for granted that we're going to end up exactly where we want to go. But organising all these trains into all these platforms is incredibly complicated and relies on maths and some clever automation. At ground level, the huge scale of this station is hard to comprehend. But up here on the roof, I've got a bird's eye view. This is an incredible sight. Wow. It's so vast, it's so complicated. There's just so many tracks, so many trains constantly coming in and out. It's amazing. The station complex is spread over nearly 30,000 square meters. There are seven suburban platforms and 11 more that connect it to the rest of India. You realize how much organization there's got to be to run these trains because you know it's not like a car where you can steer around someone else or go different directions you know a trains on tracks hasn't got any choice has to go where it's pointed this complex web of tracks creates a massive challenge for the station's controllers to avoid disaster they must find a safe route through this maze for every single train they run 1500 services a day here and in rush hour, trains are just 40 seconds apart. The man in charge of this supersized puzzle is senior divisional operations manager K. N. Singh. Please, Mr. Robert. Oh, please, you. please. Wow. He's taking me to the heart of the network, the control room. To explain the systems they use to organize the traffic. Oh, this is an extraordinary room. So what yeah, goes on in is, here? This is the, our main TMS room, what is called train management system room. And you are in the nerve center. This 12 meter long LED screen is a live map of the station and the lines that feed it. It shows where every train across 53 kilometers of Greater Mumbai is right now. This board looks so confusing. There's so many lines, so many numbers on it. I, I, I can't make head or tail of it. What is this showing us? You can see, like in platform number four, the AN17 local is standing, and just see the red, the red mark. Red yeah. mark. Oh, so the the red section on each line that means that's actually a train in the platform at the moment. Good, good, good. And if the route is free, it will show you green, so right. train can move. And now the train is moving. Good. Now the red signal is moving ahead. And now it has covered a fairly large distance. And now it is almost standing at signal L001. Thanks to hundreds of kilometers of cables that transmit information from the track to the control room, the train management system, or TMS board, is able to pinpoint the exact location of every train. Each section of track has a low electrical current running through it. When the track is clear, the electrical circuit is complete and a switch, called a relay, is held closed. On the board, the route shows as green. But when a train enters that section of track, the circuit is broken and the relay switch releases. The track shows up as red, occupied. The switches or relays that communicate this information to the control room are housed here. Goodness me. That's a lot of wire. I love, I love the, all the little clicking that's yeah, going yeah, on. Yeah. 
these relays are very instrumental in uh, modern day signaling. Relays don't only tell the control room and station controllers where the trains are. They also control the movements of those trains through the operation of points and signals. So all these then are the, the these are the switches or the relays from coming from all over CST. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the relays are basically used to control the entire system of all the entire signals, signal and the points. routes, points, track. Have you seen the olden uh, railways where we used to uh, oh, big, levers, big lever to pull, frame, yeah. which we used to pull? Now, those jobs have been taken over by these relays. Right, so that's yeah. what these are doing. That's what these, thing, yeah. these relays are doing. It's the connection between relays and signals that prevents accidents. A track relay is linked to the signal at the start of every section of track. The signal shows green when the circuit is complete, telling the next train it's safe to proceed. But when a train enters and breaks the circuit, the signal defaults to red, warning the following train to stop. Although circuitry is doing most of the work, humans are still a crucial part of this system. At least eight people man this control room 24 hours a day. The safe running of the trains is in their hands. And in rush hour, that's a nerve-wracking task. With 88 trains coming in and out every hour, there's no space for error. And most days, there's a problem the computers can't fix. So, Mr Singh, what happens then if there is, a, like, a train breakdown or a, a, a signal failure? What do you do then to, to deal with that? If there's any failure or something, then my control takes over. Yes. If there's any problem, he will reroute, he will divert, he will cancel. See, he's con constantly communicating with all the... Yeah, he's always talking to people. Yeah, he's yeah. always talking to people. So if, a, say, a train had broken down, he, he could talk to the engineering department or whoever was involved to fix it or whatever. Right, yeah. right. I mean, he talks to the engineer and he asks, what is to be done? Just tell me within minutes. Right. So he decides everything in a split of second. The room is full of quietly concentrating people, in stark contrast to the rest of the terminus. It's the perfect alliance of humans and technology, and meant that those rush hour trains we caught earlier arrived safely. Mr. K.N. Singh is with us here today. Now, Mr. Singh, um, we've seen how incredibly complicated it is to run this station. We've seen it from the point of view of passengers and, of course, from your controllers. But what is the kind of capacity that you're running the station at? Well, I mean, this station of CSTM is running in the peak hours. It's running with almost 100% capacity. We do not have a chance to add any extra train at the station. During lean time, yes, we can do something, but the demand is only for the peak time. Everybody wants to travel in the peak time. That must make your daily task in organizing all this and all the tracks that go right out of Mumbai, that's got to make oh, that quite complicated. It's a big responsibility to run the train punctually, safely, I mean, all the time. It's a, it's a tough job. It's yeah. a tough job. There's no doubt about it because this entire city is dependent on you. Now, would it be fair to say, though, that this is the most challenging station to run in the whole of India? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are a lot of stations uh, running a lot of trains, but I don't think we can compare CSTM with any other stations in India. See so here the number of trains which we are running, approximately 1,500 plus trains. Uh, every day? Oh, every day. I mean, and both long distance as well as suburban. That's again making it a unique station in India. So if you are running at, at, at peak times at 100% capacity, if something goes slightly wrong, not a big disaster, but, you know, train breaks down, signals fail, all those sort of things. How on earth do you cope with that and how long oh. does it take to get back on, on oh. track? In, in, including peak time, we just pray to God that nothing should go wrong, <laughs> number one, first thing, because it is the, uh, it is the performance of the peak hour that judges the, how, the my whole, customer the satisfaction yes. at the same time my satisfaction also. Yeah. Any failure in peak times simply cripples the operation. Right. Number one, it increases the overcrowding in train. 
sometime if it persists for a long time, then we have to cancel some train. So that's why we we warned that there should not be any problem during peak time. Yes, yes. So you really work towards making we sure. We work making sure that our target that 100% punctuality should be achieved during peak hours. Right. I must say, I don't envy your task. It sounds very stressful, very complicated, and you seem to deal with it very well. So thank you very much, Mr. Thank Singh. you, Robert. Thank, thank you. you. Down here on the concourse, as Robert just heard, this place is operating capacity. Well, it certainly feels like it is. Uh, things have been very different back in 1887, when this station was completed. Back then, there were just four platforms here. It would have been a far more genteel scene. Really, the, the reason this station exists, the reason the Indian railways exist, is because they were planned and built by the British. For that, we have to thank a man called Lord Dalhousie, Governor General of British India. He's still commemorated on a, a bust on the front of this building. And but he wasn't interested in building railways for altruistic reasons. He was interested in railways as strategic assets, moving soldiers around the subcontinent fast to deal with any threats to British rule. Also, bringing valuable commodities out of the centre of India, bringing them here to Mumbai, sticking them on boats, and getting them out to trade with the rest of the world. Uh, John Sargent has been in Darjeeling, where he's looking at how the history of one of those valuable commodities, tea, is inextricably linked with the history of railways. Far from this morning's Mumbai rush hour, 2,000 kilometres northeast, John's journey to Darjeeling takes him close to the border with Nepal. I'm in the mountains of northern India, among the green hills of the Himalayas. When officials from the British Raj came here in the 19th century, they made a momentous discovery. They found this was the perfect place to grow these, high-quality tea bushes. The great Indian tea industry was born. For many, the name Darjeeling means tea. And the tea industry here is worth 40 million pounds a year. All right, tell me what you have to do. So what about that one, is that all right? No, not that one. So it's just the tiny ones, okay. Is that about that all right? Yes? yes? Okay. So we get going. Right. Okay. I've got to try and do it as, qu as quickly. Right? <laughs> I'm not very fast. I think I need a bit more practice. Yeah? All right? Okay, right. So I have to do that too. Right, ready? Okay. <laughs> People have been plucking tea here since the 1840s. But in those early days, it was difficult. Darjeeling's remote location meant it took nearly a week to take the tea ready for export to the Indian port of Kolkata, 650 kilometers away. A quicker solution was needed. And in 1881, it arrived in the shape of the Darjeeling Hill Railway. It's one of only two remaining steam railways in India. These antique locomotives were built in Britain and shipped here specially for this line. This is called the toy train, but when it was built, it was very far from being a toy. It was a magnificent piece of engineering. The line is 82 kilometers long and rises more than 2,000 meters. This is high, high up in the mountains. For the engineers who built it, the only way to overcome the constant twists and turns and steep gradient was to use a narrow two-foot gauge. This train made this whole area economically viable. Without this train, you couldn't have had all the tea plantations, and you wouldn't have, in fact, known about Darjeeling. Darjeeling tea, why? Because of this train. The opening of this line meant that the tea could be moved from plantation to port in less than 24 hours. And that was a big commercial advance. 
As exports grew, demand increased and the plantations expanded. Within three years, almost a third of India's tea exports were carried by trains down these mountains. The high-grade leaves produced the champagne of teas. It was a precious cargo that brought much-needed wealth, and for nearly a hundred years, the railway thrived. But the good times couldn't last. It became cheaper to transport the tea on road trucks. By the 1960s, the train stopped carrying tea altogether. The relics of those glory days are tucked away in this railway workshop. These are some of the old freight wagons still kept in this place for some reason. And, oh, it's terrific, isn't it? You can just imagine it. This was built in 1926. And so at that time, something like 5,000 tonnes of tea would be produced every year and carried in these, in these wagons. Memories of that time are fading but they're easily revived over a cup of tea, obviously. For these distinguished citizens, the age of steam is not deep in the past. How old are you? Tobago, age got you, age. 90. 90? 90, yes, right. 76. 94. 94. What do you remember about the old days when the tea trains would come here? 243 years. Nowadays, there are just three daily services. Each morning, two of the Glasgow-built locos are fired into life, ready to make the round trip between Darjeeling and Goom. Tourists have replaced the tea. Thousands visit here each year, keen to experience the romance of steam travel and to see India's part in all that. Time to hop aboard. So how long have we got before the train leaves? Uh, 120, yes. 120, yeah, right. Yeah, so... just now start. Well... Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> that was a close one. For some of us, it's also an excuse to revisit our youth. I'm Jill, by the way. How are you, Jill? Jill, Jill what? Jill Hemmings. Jill Hemmings. What do you think about this? Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah, I'm really excited. Yes, how often do you get a train running on the high street? Going, there's that lovely... And does that remind you when you were a child yes, of seeing exactly. steam engines? Yes, yes. I like the noise and the smell of it, isn't it? Yes, and the, the, actually the, the smut coming in through the window. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, when, when I was a child, we were told not to look out yeah, the windows. Absolutely. But did you? Well, yes. Yes, <laughs> Along with my fellow passengers, I've really enjoyed steaming into the past. This is how we should travel. In Mumbai, it's mid-morning. And the commuters are being replaced by a new army of workers who use these trains to feed the city. It's just gone 11 o'clock and food and the train have a very unique and vital connection here in Mumbai. This is Platform 7 at CST and these fellows are known as the Dabba Wallas. Dabba means box or in this context lunchbox and Bala means man. So they're the lunchbox men. The system is really simple. Basically you trot off to work, somebody at home cooks your lunch and they will hand deliver it to your office every day. 
as we've seen, you've little chance of struggling onto a rush hour train with your lunch in a bag. So this is an extraordinary solution. Someone at home hands your lunch to a dabbawala, who then does a relay race with his colleagues across the city to get it to your desk. Hundreds of thousands of ordinary families across Mumbai use this service every day. Here's how it works for one couple. Hi, I'm Jignesh Ganatra. I live in the northern side of Bombay. I work for a bank in South Mumbai. I'm Dr. Dipti Ganatra. I'm homeopath by profession. I stay with my mother-in-law, my uh, husband, my kid. Mama ke ki smile liye tu. And I have a maid. She helps me cook food also, take care of my kid and my mother-in-law. Every morning I cook uh, food for my husband. I put different things in different compartments. It's okra or the lady finger vegetable, the dal, rice and chapatis. So a dabba wala is a person who takes lunch in a box from home to the office areas or the place where a person works. That's how he enjoys homemade food sitting in his office. <laughs> Using the services of Dabbawala is uh, important because in the morning when we commute by train, it's pretty uh, crowded and it becomes really difficult to carry the Dabba with us. That's why uh, using the services of Dabbawala. In the afternoon with the lunch, he has salad, he has achar, he has buttermilk. Achar is a pickle, homemade pickle. When the Dabbawala actually comes at 10, they are so punctual that you can actually match your watch with the time. They are so good at it. My son hears the bell and he is the one who shouts and yells, I'll be the one who will give the Dabba. So he goes wherever he is in the house, he just rushes to that place, takes the Dabba in this particular way. You give them the Dabba and they are off in no time. See the any the dabba wala's work. It's the amount of uh, dabbas they carry every day. It is just so mind blowing that how do they manage the whole thing is just unimaginable. Dabbawalas have a quite a harrowing time. And come rain, come sun, whatever be the climatic conditions, they always ensure that the Dabbas reach the office on time. They are very dedicated towards their task. I think you can't think of Dabbawalas without the trains. It is not going to be possible because the way the train schedules are, generally they are again spot on time. So the entire routine which they have cannot be fulfilled without the trains being around. <laughs> The way Dabbawala's function, it's, it's like 99.99% accuracy. It never happens that a single Dabba reaches in a wrong hand. My uh, wife is a fabulous cook. And more importantly, the food is cooked with love and affection. 
So that makes the taste even more better. Incredible, isn't it? Well, I'm joined by Dr. Bhavan Agarwal, who has studied the double wallers, written a PhD all about them, and now helps educate their children. So, Dr. Agarwal, you're the perfect person to tell me more about this fascinating system. How many double wallers are there in Mumbai? Total 5,000 double wallers are there, and they are delivering 200,000 tiffin every day. That must weigh an absolute ton. What's the weight of all of that? How much are they carrying each? They carry approximately 60, 65 kg weight because each person carrying approximate 40 tiffin. 40 tiffin with food, with basket, comes 60, 65 kg weight. 5,000 Dabbawalas delivering 200,000, about 65 kgs on their backs, very strong men. How exactly does it work? It starts from 50, 60 kilometers away. From my front door? Yes. I've cooked the meal. You cook the meal? Yes. One person will come to collect from your front door. He will bring to the nearest station. He will hand over in relay, second person, that second person will drop at the third station and he will deliver to the last fourth person. In the case of Jignesh and Dipti Ganatra, one Dabbawala picks it up from their house by bike, transfers it to another at Malund station, and the final leg of its journey from CST is made by a third Dabbawala and a handcart. To make sure every lunch gets to the right person, they use a special coding system. I can see you've got some letters on this different box. Explain. This is a coding system. Right. This is residential area of customer, Ville Parle. The man who collects tiffin from home, this is a destination station, element point. It's called business district. Right. This person who will pick from business district, he will deliver express to our building on 12th floor. It's brilliant. So it's like a postcode. You've got the, the place where it's being picked up from. That's Ville Parle, which is a, a suburb of Mumbai. This is the chap that picks it up, his unique code. This is the place it's being delivered to, Nariman Point, the business district, and this is the chap that will deliver it to him. They never do any mistakes. It's a 160 million. I would say more perfect than that. Who's cooking the dabbas now? Because a lot of women are going to work here, aren't they? The food is cooked by customer's wife, mother or sister. But what if they go to work? Because the nuclear family is breaking up here just like it is in any other developing nation. It's true. Nowadays, there is nuclear families, but there are many families where cooked person is there, maybe mother, sister, wife. And in those families who is nobody there to cook, they ask to collect from hotel or some mess. Right, so they're getting it delivered from a hotel or a restaurant. Do you yes. get a dabba delivered at work? Yes, I get every day from my wife because she cooks very good. Yes, it is course. costly to outside. You're a good husband for saying that, aren't you? You have to say that. <laughs> and without the trains, would the dabba wallas exist? Would their system run without the train network? No, it's impossible. Without local train, they can't deliver. And if I wanted to use this service, how much would it cost me a month? For one person, it's like six pound per month. And is that quite reasonable? Is that very affordable? Yeah, very reasonable. Even for the ball, it's very reasonable. They earn 150 pound per month. Mumbai is like any other big city in India. There's lots of fast food joints, coffee shops opening up, particularly in these business districts. Will people stop getting home delivery food and start eating out? I won't say they will stop. The reason behind this, it is very, important to take care of health. Because of health, many people want home-cooked food. Number two, outside is costly to eat. So despite facilities are available, many people getting services from home-cooked food only. So I feel it is continuing. And it's so ingrained in the culture here, isn't it? People are very used to having home-cooked food in their office. Yes, it's a culture. So they want to use it. I don't think it will stop. Dr. Agarwal, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, the system has been in place here since 1890, running every single day. The Dubba Wallers are almost as old as the station itself. For more than 120 years, this astonishing building has been a city icon. Designed by British architect Frederick William Stevens, the station was the earliest grand railway terminus built in India. The Great Indian Peninsula Railway India's first railway company commissioned it as their headquarters. Today, the original site has ballooned to become a city in itself, with its own police force, dormitories, court and kitchen. Three and a half thousand people work here. But it's the exterior that's attention grabbing. It was inspired by the designs of traditional Indian palaces and European railway stations. And it's a style that's unique to Mumbai. 
All right, everyone, follow me in. We're now going to be entering the Grand Chhatrapati Shivaji Terminus Railway Station. Guide Virat Kazliwal was brought up in Mumbai, and today he shares his passion for the city by taking tourists on walking tours. Work started in 1878, and it took 10 years to complete at a cost of 260,000 pounds. It was the most expensive building to have been executed in Asia at that time. Virat knows all there is to know about this building, but like most Mumbaiakas, he's never set foot in the oldest part of it. It's off limits to everyone, except railway officials and invited guests. Oh my goodness me. Anita's got special permission for a private tour. So what do you think? I think it's, it's um, awe-inspiring. I think it's, it's absolutely fantastic to be in here under the main dome. It feels like we've entered into a church. It doesn't feel like a like government a office station. block. Absolutely. It doesn't feel like a railway station. It doesn't even feel like we're in India right now. It yes, feels actually, like we're somewhere completely somewhere different. Somewhere in, in Europe, somewhere yeah. in the middle, middle of Europe. And it's, it's just simply beautiful. The decoration and beauty in here is astonishing. Wow. <laughs> I don't know what to look at first. Every available surface is covered with flowers, animals and railway motifs. We've got the Statue of Progress up there and the gargoyles and the beautiful sculpture work. They're my favourites, the crocodiles. Students from Mumbai's Architectural College carved the decoration from Indian sandstone and limestone. It feels even more like a church up here. So it was actually designed in a very, very grand and imperialistic manner. Yeah. It was meant to stamp the authority of, uh, of the British on the locals. And it really does that. I, and it does. Is... It's a very grand structure. Imagine a time when there wasn't any development. There was just raw mud roads. When the station was completed, there were no cars or buses on the roads, just ox carts and pedestrians. This building was an imposing statement for the one million people who lived in Mumbai then, just as it is today for its 17 million inhabitants. Does the average Indian care about this building? Do people driving past look up at it? Mumbai is a very fast city and a lot of people don't have a lot of time for anything other than their work. But this is the one building that always gets people to look up and take notice. It's a symbol for what's most important. The railways are the most important thing to not just the country, but even the city and the functioning of the city. And what a privilege to be allowed access up here because Absolutely. nobody gets to come up here. Today, the Tickets Hall is the only area of the historic building the public can enter. Local historian Shraddha Batawadaka is showing me some overlooked features in the hustle and bustle of the modern station. I know it's a room full of people, but the first thing I had to do was look up. Yeah, the first thing you notice up here is these beautifully painted stars, and that's why this chamber is also called a star chamber. The monogram there, uh, it's quite interesting. So it's a coat of arms with an elephant, a locomotive, yeah, the George's and... Cross. So you can see the old mode of transport and the modern mode. But this is the ticket hall. So this is the only bit of CST that members of the public uh, can come into, is that right? Originally when uh, Frederick William Stevens, the architect of the building, designed uh, this particular hall, uh, he designed it as a booking office and a waiting room. This today remains the only interface of this structure with the public. But now it's a really different place. Now you have lots of people buying tickets here to travel locally around Mumbai. Yeah. Today's commuters seem oblivious to the heritage around them. But there's a piece of railway history hidden in the station that predates the building and all the present day structure. Shudha, somehow we've managed to find the quietest bit of the station. Yeah. Where are you taking me? To the end of this platform to show you uh, the place from where the first ever train in India ran way back in 1853. And where was it going? It was going to Thana, 
uh, which was uh, 21 miles from uh, this station. Uh, the station was called Bori Bandar at that time. What does Bori Bandar mean? Bori means sacks of cotton and Bandar means port. And uh, this area was called Bori Bandar because of its vicinity with the port of Bombay. Cotton was king in 19th century India, the country's biggest export. And the original Bori Bandar station was perfectly positioned to get cotton to the port. So where would this platform have been? Somewhere just before that bridge. Just there? Just there, yes. There's nothing to signify that it was here. There's no blue plaque. Show that I'm a little bit disappointed. You're in Mumbai, so here change is the only constant. The railways have been continuously running for the last 160 years. Uh, so there have been a lot of changes. There's no place for sentiment in this crowded station. Tracks and signals have jostled history out of the way. But what happened here laid the foundation for India's modern rail network. And today, that system transports more passengers than any other on Earth. This place is a palace to rail, isn't it? It absolutely is, and intentionally so. The British set out to make a real statement here. They were saying, you've seen those big, grand 19th century stations in Europe. Well, this is going to cast all that in the shade. And you can read that building. There's a statue of progress on the top, and she's flanked by a statue of commerce and agriculture. This building is saying that we're going to use this cutting-edge new technology, the railways, to link India up, exploit this vast natural treasure house, and create an economic superpower, put it on the map. And of course, to a large extent, that is what happened. And I think it's true that the railways have helped to make Mumbai and India a major player in the global economy today. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And it really is the central part of the city's transport hub. But when you first look at it, what struck me is, like the rest of India, you just think it's completely insane. People hanging off trains, millions of people, who knows where they're going. But then you look closely and you see that there is structure, it's pretty slick and it's precise, but then it would have to be. There is no way you could run an organisation this big and this complex without some sort of ironclad system. But then I don't think I could cope with that commute, not every day. I mean, these Mumbikers, they're a tough crowd, aren't they? They really are. And we have only just scratched the surface of this station. Here's what's coming up next time. <laughs> Today we immerse you in the madness and chaos of a Mumbai rush hour. Tomorrow we'll transport you long distance across India. Anita escapes the rush hour crowds to ride one of the most popular trains, but finds conditions on board just as challenging. It's every man and woman for himself, squeezing where you can. I visit the extraordinary supersized facility, meeting the needs of long distance passengers. This is a big pile of dirty laundry. How much comes in here every day? Uh, every day around 25,000 bed sheets. 25,000? 25,000. Jewelry, motorbikes, and furniture. Robert discovers what else travels alongside passengers. I'm very confident that in these packages, there's a large amount of fish. That is basically. Uh, information that's going in through my nose. And from fish to fine dining, we take a tour of India's poshest train. And who spends the most money? The Russians. All that coming up tomorrow. Thanks for joining us here in Mumbai. See you next time. But for now, goodbye. Goodbye.